What we're going to talk about today, though, are a couple of different things, and I want to start by telling a little story uh, that transpired in the spring and summer of 1896, a period when members of the imperial family, Russian government ministers, businessmen, industrialists, along with artists, journalists, ordinary subjects, and dignitaries from all over the empire, and indeed from all over the world, converged on the central Russian city of Nizhny Novgorod to attend something known as the All-Russian Exhibition of Industry and the Arts. This was an undertaking very similar to that London exhibition, the Crystal Palace exhibition that was held in mid-century that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And the exhibition in Nizhny Novgorod was also similar to earlier similar exhibitions that had been held in, in Moscow. There was one in 1882 uh, and about a dozen or so others dating all the way back uh, to the 1830s. And like those earlier undertakings, the Nizhny Novgorod exhibition of 1896 was designed to advance domestic trade and commerce by showcasing the products and the manufactured goods of the Russian Empire. The one from 1896 follows three years behind the World's Columbian Exposition held in Chicago, Illinois. For those of you who may know a little bit about Chicago history, this was the famous spectacle that included the so-called White City, that electrified section of uh, the exposition where illuminated lights shone uh, throughout most of the night. If you've ever been to the south side of Chicago near the University of Chicago campus, you can still see some of the streets that were originally constructed to house uh, this, the world's Columbian Exposition. The Nizhny Novgorod Exhibition was a quintessential example of compensatory symbolism. It was purposely intended to contrast the empire in 1896 from the empire 12, 13, 14 years later. In fact, the brochures that were made for this exposition would, would go so far as to state that the exhibition of 1896 was intended, quote, to draw attention to the success of Russian creative works and labor since the last Moscow exhibition of 1882. That is, to draw attention to the 14-year period coinciding roughly with the reign of the dearly departed emperor Alexander III. What this exhibition was designed to do was to showcase native progress in science and especially technological fields. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Some of the interesting things that you would have seen had you been able to go to the exposition, uh, exhibition in 1896. Immense amounts of money were spent constructing palatial grounds in the central Russian city of Nizhny Novgorod. Why was, it, why was the exhibition held there as opposed to Moscow or St. Petersburg? In no small part because Nizhny Novgorod had long been an important commercial and trading center for the Russian Empire. The city had been founded in, in, in the year 1221 uh, by the fourth Grand Prince of Vladimir, Yuri II. And like many Russian cities, you know by now, it was originally established as a fortress. It's a military outpost, and it's around that military outpost the rest of the city is going to grow. And over the centuries, <coughs> Nizhny Novgorod had become really a waypoint for the vast amount of commerce and trade that took place between Central Asia uh, and even further afield into China and the Far East, across Eurasia into Nizhny Novgorod, and then from Nizhny Novgorod, the trade and commerce could enter into European Russia and from there even further to the West. So the city had then and has today a reputation for being a commercial and trading center. What better place then to demonstrate the contrast between the old and the new? So vast amounts of money are going to be spent to take this sort of medieval trading center and transform it into a dazzling spectacle of industrial modernity. And the imperial state wastes virtually no money trying to do this. 84 hectares along the, uh, the west bank of the Oka River, uh, not too far from where the historic fairgrounds have been set up, were chosen as the site for the sprawling enterprise. More than 50 million rubles will be spent on the event, Four million alone went to simply improving the city's infrastructure. Uh, there's a new electrical supply station constructed so that portions of the city can be illuminated by electric lamps. Uh, the German firm Siemens & Halski is brought in as well to build an electric streetcar line that would run from the exhibition grounds to the city center. This meant that Nizhny Novgorod is only the second city in the Russian Empire to have electric uh, cars 
electric trains. The first being Kiev, which I mentioned in the lecture that hopefully you've had a chance to, to watch. Kiev is the first, only four years earlier. So the idea here of electric trams, these are, these are a novelty. The grounds included as well uh, this, the first cable cars ever built in, uh, in Russia. And here's a picture uh, of one of them. Um, and as you know, the city has, has high bluffs that sit outside, uh, off, away from the main fairground. And so the cable cars could go using traction up, uh, up the hills and into the heights above. A very completely new and novel thing. Now, in addition, a new railway station was built. Um, and you can see that here on the map showcased here the very northern part, to bring what was expected to be the hundreds of thousands of people who would come from all over the empire. Absolute immense sums of money, in other words, are going to be spent. The Ministry of Finance is going to, is going to bankroll the construction of a two and a half mile electric tram over and above the one going from the fairground to the center. There's an electric tram that, that goes the, 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 uh, the distance all the way around uh, the fairgrounds itself. So the money is being spent here to be able to move people around the fairground. The state would also pay for more than 70 large buildings, including a 900-seat meeting hall, several deluxe hotels, and 55 ornate pavilions uh, that would be that would house the official departments that were sponsored in the main by state agencies. So you have, for example, the, the Ministry of State Domains. Um, in addition to that, um, I'm trying to think of the other ones that are there. The Ministry of State Domains would be one, Ministry of, of, of Public Transport, the Ministry of War, uh, the Naval Ministry, the Ministry of Public Education. They're all going to sponsor departments um, or little individual meeting houses uh, that you can see here in this picture off to the side. These would be some of the departments, uh, Yeli is what they call them in Russian. And you would go in and you would see what the Ministry of State Domains has to show. It's like going to a, a fair or an exhibition that you, would, that you would go to. You went to the Illinois State Fair if we had one. Did we, we had one, didn't we? Do those things still exist? No, the, 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 this has all been this has all been uh, taken down. Okay, because it's not it's not meant to be a permanent ex ex exhibition. Okay, just like this, just like the one in Chicago in 1893 wasn't. Just like that, the Crystal Palace was not intended to be permanent. Although in 1851 there was such uh, outpouring of support for maintaining that structure that it's broken down and reassembled out at, uh, at Sydenham. A huge circular pavilion, measuring 980 feet. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, diameter and enclosing more than 123,000 cubic feet uh, served as, as one of the centerpieces. There was also a kaleidoscopic array of new custom-built structures that would emerge around the recycled uh, pavilion and they looked, uh, in some of them looked very, very odd, some of them looked very, very modern. The central space uh, was occupied by something known as the machinery hall. An enormous structure that was built to house the largest collection of steam and diesel engines, electrotechnical equipment, and manufacturing devices that had ever been assembled anywhere in Imperial Russian history. This building was designed by an architect named Alexander Pomerantsev. He was, Pomerantsev was the exhibition's chief architect. He was also one of the Russian Empire's most creative builders at this time, and what he constructs for the machinery hall is an unabashedly modern edifice. The building that he constructs in Nizhny Novgorod is actually a knockoff of an earlier building that he had constructed in Moscow. And the building that he had built in Moscow is, is regarded really as his architectural masterpiece. It was known as the Upper Trading Rows, and it was built between 1889 and 1893. It is a colossal three-story building uh, that sits opposite the Kremlin alongside Red Square. So th this, what this picture, if you're looking at this picture, St. Basil's, the church, is going to be right here, sort of over our shoulders to the left. The Kremlin itself, the walls of the Kremlin, are directly across. Okay. The historical museum is down at the end, and when during the Soviet times, the tank parades, the military parades would inevitably occur, they would march from that way, and they would cross in front of what would later, in the Soviet period, be renamed the State Gasudarsny uh, Universalny Magazine. It's GUM in its Russian acronym. It means like uh, the, the State Universal Store, or the Universal Magazine. Uh, magazine uh, being uh, like a department store. Okay. So inside, you have all sorts of small kiosks and places to do business, 
but this edifice of this building itself is simply uh, ginormous. Um, the, uh, the, the main facade that you see here is 800 feet long. So from this end to that end, it's the length of eight football fields. No, no, that's, that's too long. It's the length of uh, a two and a half football fields. 800 feet, not 800 yards. Two and a half football fields. The upper trading rows combine state-of-the-art construction techniques and materials beneath a very ornate exterior. But what was really fantastic about this uh, building was the interior. This is what it looks like. This is a recent picture, and I apologize here for the, uh, the quality of, of, of the projector. It'll look better if you get to see it on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, the interior uh, utilized for the very first time, uh, it's believed in Russian history, uh, reinforced concrete. And what this meant was that the reinforced concrete enabled you to open up the interior and to create a space inside without having mortar and, and, and tendon walls, breaking everything down and making it uh, much smaller. At the time that this building opens in 1893, it was the largest and the most technologically advanced building, commercial building, in all of Europe. It is entirely a Russian construction, entirely designed uh, by, by Russian engineers. And the completion of this building would mark, according to one architectural historian, a turning point in Russian architectural history. Not only because the upper trading rows represented the apogee of the search for a national style, but also because it demanded advanced functional technology used on a scale unprecedented in Russian civil architecture. It's one thing, of course, to imagine as an architect this gigantic vaulted glass roof. It's another thing altogether to build it. The man who does that is a fellow named Vladimir Shulkov, one of the most inventive and versatile figures in the history of world civil engineering. He is the technical genius behind the upper trading rows. It is his design for the arched glass and iron skylight and his work on the building's reinforced concrete interior that makes possible that sort of fusion of aesthetic form and practical function that had been envisioned by the architect. Shukhov, he is, arguably the, he is arguably the greatest civil engineer at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, he is a rival uh, to the very best American and European um, inventors uh, and technical experts. He would reprise his critical role in designing the upper trading rows, 1889 to 1893, he solves the engineering principles. He's going to come back then in 1895 and help Pomerantsev realize the design for the machinery hall at Nizhny Novgorod. And he's going to do something else at Nizhny Novgorod as well. What he is going to unveil there are a series of brand new buildings, the likes of which had never before been constructed anywhere in human history. His approach is referred to as a metal lace approach. A metal lace approach. The rotunda building uh, at the uh, Nizhny Novgorod exhibition was a very good example of this. It was 238 feet in diameter. It had a 56 foot high uh, top. And what it, what it employed uh, were a series of complex mathematical analysis and non-Euclidean geometry to produce what we call today doubly curved or hyperbolic structures. Hyperbolic structures, doubly curved or hyperbolic structures. This is the interior of uh, one of his lace pavilions under construction. And what we're looking at here, these are the interior supports that are propping up the roof. The roof itself is made, as you can see here, these are just straight iron bars but they're laid out in a pattern that gives them this, this doubly curved or this hyperbolic appearance. This was nothing short of a revolution in, uh, in, 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 in construction methods. The structures that would emerge from this process resembled nets or woven baskets. They're known today, the, these types of forms, they're known as hyperboloids of revolution. And what you end up producing is a lightweight tensile surface that's capable of bearing immense loads while using minimal materials, limited time, and a limited labor force in the process of constructing them. The, the uh, roof design that Shukov had undertaken for the upper trading rows, the building in Moscow, 
This was, believe it or not, Shukhov's very first attempt at architectural engineering. That's a heck of a way to begin your career as an architectural engineer. The very first time you set out to design an engineered product for an architectural purpose, you create something like this. And he follows it up three years later with his hyperboard lights of revolution. The two main buildings, the, the elliptical pavilion uh, and his uh, uh, rotunda are two of the examples. But honestly, the other one that's really impressive from an aesthetic and engineering standpoint was the so-called lattice tower. Lattice tower. It was built for the rather prosaic purpose of supplying water to the exhibition grounds. This is a water tower. Water tank that you see in any small town, any big city uh, in the Midwest or anywhere else you go in the United States. Right? A very large um, barrel, a metal barrel up top, uh, containing uh, 22,500 gallons of water, weighing around 93,000 pounds, perched gracefully 80 feet in the air using these hyperboloid structures, these straight iron bars that are curving. Inside the tower is a spiral staircase. So you could climb up the tower and you could go to the observation platform at the very top of it. This would prove to be the most popular of all of the 1896 exhibitions, uh, architectural attractions. And it calls into mind another architectural wonder built in 1889 for an earlier World's Fair. 1889, World's Fair is held in Paris. Celebrate the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution, and a French engineer by the name of Gustave Eiffel will construct what is known today as the Eiffel Tower. Everybody knows the Eiffel Tower. Have you ever seen this? Probably not. This is actually of those two iconic towers built to celebrate exhibitions. It's this that is actually the far more important than the Eiffel Tower, although everybody knows that. The reason for that is that Shukhov's uh, hyperboloids of revolution produce a functional way of, of incorporating this design element into other things. The Eiffel Tower is a singular piece. It's constructed, it stands, everybody knows it. Shukhov's design, however, proves to be practical. He's going to patent it in 1899, and this lattice method will subsequently be used in the construction of thousands of water towers across <coughs> Russia. It will also be used to create radio broadcasting stations, lighthouses, and it will even be incorporated into the masts of at least 40 Russian and American battleships at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Shukov's impressive showing, I mean, the buildings that he creates, the hyperboloids of revolution he devises, demonstrate the transformative contributions that Imperial Russian subjects were capable of making to science and technology when they had adequate resources and when they had the freedom to innovate. One of the curious things about Shukov is that he shared something that very few Russian inventors or technicians enjoyed. Shukov shared this with what virtually all of the successful inventors in Europe and the United States possessed. His career was made possible not simply to his genius, but to the fact that he had commercial considerations and he had material security provided by entrepreneurial supporters. And this is one of the things that I really wanted to drive home in that last lecture. When we look at the failures of what I call the Russian if-only inventors, Alexander Ledigin, Pavel Yablochkov, the ones who innovate in electric lighting but never succeed, Mikhail Dolivo Dobrovolsky, the, the, the electrical engineer who leaves Russia because he can't get into the Russian university because he's been kicked out as a student, goes to Germany, studies at Darmstadt, and helps create the three-phase generator that makes possible trans the uh, transmission of electrical power over hundreds of miles. What is it that, that Dolivo Dobrovolsky had that made him a success that Lodigan and, uh, and Yablochkov did not? He had capital, he had money that he could draw upon that came from his company, uh, and he had the material support necessary to realize not only his inventions into fruition, but then to commercialize those applications. Shukov ends up by pure happenstance falling into a situation where he has security, financial security, professional security, and with those two things, the freedom to innovate or the freedom to fail.
the freedom to fail, which I indicated, I've said before, it's, it's the most important and most often overlooked aspect of the history of technology. If you want to be a successful inventor, you have to have the freedom to fail because you learn from your failures. Shrukov had been born in Kursk province, the family of a regional bank manager. And he would be sent to St. Petersburg for his primary education before earning a degree in engineering mechanics, which he gets with honors, from the Moscow Technical Institute. He completes his studies in 1876, and he's offered a very prestigious academic assistantship at St. Petersburg University, but he declines it. He turns it down in order to participate on a state-sponsored commission to the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, held in 1876, is the first World's Fair hosted by the United States. So the, the Chicago Exhibition of 1893 is a successor to this. The St. Louis World's Fair in uh, 1903 is another example of this. Okay? But it's the Centennial Exhibition, right, 100th anniversary of, of, of the Revolution, that's the United States' first World's Fair. So Shukov is sent to the United States to attend this exhibition and to gather information on American technical systems. He's sent there effectively as an industrial spy. He's in the United States for a year, and he researches a whole host of novel American devices, from Singer sewing machines to the Bell telephone system. He looks at mechanical typewriters. He takes a side trip to Pittsburgh, where he studies machine building methods, oil production facilities, and the United States railroad system. But what ultimately transforms his career and makes possible later all of those great inventions is a meeting by accident in Philadelphia with a fellow by the name of Alexander Boddy. A prominent civil engineer who had been hired to be the superintendent of construction who oversaw the building of all of the Centennial Exhibition's pavilions. Boddy is an immensely fascinating character. He was an American citizen of French and Jewish descent who had been born in Russia. A Russian-born American citizen of French and Jewish descent. He, uh, his family would emigrate when he was young. He comes to the United States. He adopts American language, adopts American customs uh, to the best that he can. And he's going to extend a great deal of support and assistance to the members of the Russian commission that have come over along with Shukov. So Shukov is going to meet Body in Philadelphia. And the following year, after continuing to correspond with Shukov and that sort of thing, Body decides that he's now going to relocate. He's going to pack up his belongings, he's going to leave the United States, and he's going to go back to Russia to try and set up a business. <clears throat> Unfortunately for Body, his initial efforts proved to be a failure. You know, his idea is a little bit too far advanced for the time. What he wants to do is to design and produce electrical motors. But in 1877, 1878, there's not a big enough market for this. <clears throat> Remember, this is the time that Yablochkov and Ladigan are experimenting. They're having trouble getting their businesses set up. Body is going to get into electrical business. It's going to fail. So he decides what he's going to do is he's going to, he's going to uh, form a, a partnership with another retired uh, military engineer and a very well-connected <coughs> member of the Russian Technical Society. You don't worry about the guy's name. The point is that Body is going to set up a, a company the company is going to be geared toward providing solutions and equipment to Russia's emerging petroleum industry, which is based around the Caspian Sea near the city of Baku. Soon after Body forms his first company, he is going to hire Vladimir Shukov. Shukov is going to become uh, his chief engineer. From 1876 until World War I, Shukov and Body are going to have a business partnership. They're going to work together for almost 40 years. And as a result of this partnership, Shukov's genius is not only going to flower, it's going to be realized in physical material things. Body's patronage gave Shukov the financial security, the material resources, and the professional challenges that Shukov needed to channel his creative energies towards transformative <clears throat> ends. Between 1877 and 1880, Body's new firm focused most of its attention on engineering solutions and manufacturing devices for its leading client. Its leading client was a company by the name of Granoble. 
the name given to the noble families, oil and business interests in Russia. You've heard of the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the family that establishes the Nobel Peace Prize. Ra Noble is the name of the company that they form. They make their, they make, they are going to make millions in petroleum by exploiting uh, the, the emerging Russian market in and around the Caspian. What do they bring to Russia that the Russians need? What do they bring, what do the foreigners always bring to Russia that the Russians initially need? Technology. Technology and? Knowledge. Technical knowledge. And? Capital. Capital. Okay, this is an example of the things that I talked about last week regarding engineering. Why Ladigan fails, why Yablochkov fails until he gets to Paris. It's in Paris that Yablochkov succeeds. It's in the United States that Ladigan has success after he immigrates. Why? Because there he has infrastructure, he has technical support, he has capital, access to capital, and access then to, to markets through which you can commercialize your inventions. So, working with Bra Noble, what a body's firm is able to do is to generate a great deal of business. After 1880, Body is going to diversify, and he establishes something known as the Russian American Oil Company. He's going to begin manufacturing uh, and selling kerosene and other petroleum derivatives. That same year, 1880, uh, uh, he also creates something known as the AV, his, his initials, the AV Body Technical Office. This is the very first private engineering firm in Russian history. So Body establishes the first engineering firm in Russia. Throughout this entire time, Shukhov is working along with him as a lead engineer, then later as a chief engineer for the entire company. The results of the cooperation between Body and Shukhov end up being as impressive as anything achieved by Thomas Edison uh, or by a George Westinghouse in their laboratories. Freed from workaday concerns, thanks to Body's consummate business skill. He's a, he's a Russian-born, but Americanized businessman. Where has he learned to do business? In the United States. He understands the way in which capital markets and commercialization, uh, uh, advertising, those types of things work in a modernizing economy. And thanks to this close cooperation where Shukov is left to, to, to engineer solutions, and Body is providing the, the funds and, and, the, and the resources, Shukov is at liberty to focus his talents on what are going to become a series of epochal breakthroughs. Among the things that Shukov is responsible for designing is one of the world's very first oil pipelines. How important are those things today? He's also going to pioneer the cylindrical oil tank. Have you ever been? Have you ever been by a petroleum uh, processing plant where they hold the, the, the giant cylindrical tanks? That's something that Shulkov invents. Prior to that, they were held in box-like structures. Boxes tend to leak at those edges. How do you get it to seal properly? Shulkov devises the cylindrical oil tank. He also transforms naval engineering with the design of a greatly improved hull for river-going barges. Over the course of many years, Shukov will create and Body will build new municipal water systems, highly efficient oil pumps, and a revolutionary furnace that burned a previously wasted petroleum byproduct that is known today as fuel oil. So Shukov is going to, is going to create the engine that can make use out of fuel oil. Shukov in 1891 is going to invent something known as the thermal cracking process. Thermal cracking. It's an advance that's critical to the emergence of the modern hydrocarbon economy. You use thermal, thermal cracking uh, to produce things like gasoline and kerosene. Okay. Uh, Body is going to expand his business to include general construction projects in the 1880s. And it's at that point in the 1880s that Shulka will begin experimenting with new materials. And he begins only then in the 1880s devising the analytical principles and construction techniques necessary for things like the roof on the upper trading rows, or the hyperboloid lattice uh, forms. So what we, what we see at Nizhny Novgorod in 1896 is really the culmin, it, it, it's the origin of, of, of Shulkov's entry into architectural engineering, but it's coming now after about 15 years or so of working in applied engineering uh, fields on a whole range of things from petroleum to construction uh, to machinery uh, to thermal cracking and that sort of thing as I've already mentioned. Uh, he really is amazing. 
Shukov is. But he's amazing in, in no small part because of that partnership with Body. Had there been no Alexander Body, there would have been no Shukov. And that's, that's the point that I want to drive home. It's not simply having a great idea. You've got to have a great idea, access to capital, freedom to fail, the entrepreneurial support, access to commercial markets, and these two men are going to come together and they are going to realize that. Shukov's lifetime of achievement, and he's, he, he succeeds over and over and over again with major breakthroughs over a span of about 30 years. He is the exception that proves the rule governing Russian technological innovation. Working in tandem with his entrepreneurial patron body, he's able to sustain the serial development and commercialization of new technologies for more than two decades. No other Russian comes close. He is doing exactly what Edison, Westinghouse, Tesla, Sperry, uh, the Wright brothers, although they're more limited, right, with, uh, with, with, the, with the first airplane and propellers and things like that. Shukov is doing exactly what those Americans and those Europeans are doing. And he is doing it on a level that every, in every sense of the word, matches and in some ways exceeds their accomplishments. But he is the exception to the rule. Far more typical was a fellow by the name of Pyotr Freza, who along uh, with his partner, a fellow by the name of Yevgeny Yakovlev, and unfortunately, there is no picture that I can find of uh, Yevgeny Yakovlev, so I've left him off. Here's Freza. Yevgeny Yakovlev, Y-A-K-O-V-L-E-V. They're another inventive entrepreneurial team uh, who actually, like Shukov and Body, were also at the Nizhny Novgorod exhibition in 1896. Their experience was far more closely related to that of Ladigan, Yablochkov, and the countless other, if only, inventors I've talked about this semester, going all the way back, I remember Kulibin, Polzunov, and those other ones. One of the ironies, this, this, this is a great story. These two guys are going to meet just like Body and Shukov met. They end up meeting by happenstance at a World's Fair. They meet at the World's Fair, not in 1876 in Philadelphia, right, where Body and Shukov got together for the first time. They meet instead in Chicago in 1893. They both happen to be at the World's Fair. They, they're, they're, they're businessmen by this point, and they've come to the Chicago Exposition to showcase their products that they manufacture in their respective enterprises. Freza, whom I have a picture of, <coughs> excuse me, was a graduate of the St. Petersburg Mining Institute, and he was a talented engineer. He was the, he was the co-proprietor of something known as Nellis and Frez Company. It was a St. Petersburg carriage manufacturing firm. They built carriages. They built really nice carriages. Their clientele included members of the imperial household. So he's building carriages, traveling carriages and coaches for the family of the Tsar. That's Freza. Yakovlev was a formal, former naval engineer turned mechanic and businessman. He had recently made a name for himself in, in, in St. Petersburg among the technical and scientific community because uh, Yakovlev was the first Russian subject who was able to construct a working internal combustion engine. He did this in 1889. At the time of the Chicago Exposition in 1893, he was the proprietor of a two-year-old firm, the Yakovlev Machine Building Iron and Brass Casting Plant. It was among the very, very few Russian enterprises producing gasoline and kerosene motors for sale to the public. Where are we going with this? We have a carriage manufacturer and the only Russian building internal combustion engines. They go to cars. They come to Chicago in 1893, and we actually don't know that much about their lives. They don't leave behind private papers. There's no private archive. We sort of collect this from the local stories that are told. But we know that their partnership emerged in 1893 at that exposition because they came and they were at the, they were at the place the same time where they came to look at Carl Benz's Velo. 
They both were interested in this creation. This is what most historians refer to as the first automobile. A standardized single cylinder engine automobile. This was on display in Chicago at 18, in 1893. The two men are there, they're looking at it, come to find out, they meet each other somehow, they're both Russians, they're both in St. Petersburg. One builds carriages, one builds internal combustion engines, and they decide, hey, we need to put our talents together. By cooperating, we can build Russia's first automobile. They end up uh, leaving the 1893 exposition. They travel back to St. Petersburg and they set to work. Yakovlev is obviously going to focus on the development of the engine. Freze is going to work on the chassis and the coupe. Uh, but he also has to build an original suspension. He's got to build a braking system because all of these things have been patent protected by Benz. So you've got to, you, you can't just copy Benz's braking system. You can't just copy his suspension because that violates the patent. You have to invent a, a version of your own. Russia's very first automobile emerged from the, uh, the, the factory floor in 1896, just in time to appear at the Nizhny Novgorod exhibition. So it's not just that Shukov is there showing off all these new buildings. Here are Freza and Yakovlev with their new motor carriage. And it does. It looks an awful lot like that Vila. But this is a truly all-Russian automobile. The components had been manufactured in the separate enterprises run by Yakovlev and Freza. This was a truly Russian car. The surviving accounts we have of this automobile indicate that it was well built and it was regarded as the equal of any early automobiles manufactured abroad. It had a roaring one and a half horsepower rear mounted engine that was water cooled and had it with two passenger seats. Uh, and it was capable of reaching speeds of up to 13 miles an hour on solid rubber tires attached to wooden wheels. You can imagine it was a bone jarring ride. <coughs> How significant is this? Well, I'll tell you this. The Russians build their first car one month before Henry Ford builds his first car. Henry Ford's first car uh, is the ethanol powered single seat, what he calls the quadricycle. Now, you know that Henry Ford is going to go on uh, to revolutionize transportation history by, by mass manufacturing Model Ts in the opening decades of the 20th century. Ford will produce millions of cars. Yakovlev and Freza produced one. This is it. The car attracts a great deal of attention among visitors to the expo exposition. The interest is going to be piqued by a series of demonstration drives. They're going to show this thing off. What they're trying to do is to demonstrate the vehicle is reliable and attract sales and customers. But it's, it's a luxury item in a very small commercial market for which there aren't a lot of purchasers. Russia's recently crowned czar, Nicholas II, is told of the car's presence at the exposition. He comes to visit for a couple of days, the big state event, recently crowned, he assumed the throne in 1894. He's going to come out and make the trip all the way out to Nizhny Novgorod. He's going to spend a couple of days there. And while he's on the grounds, he is told, you know, uh, uh, Your Excellency, Your Highness, uh, you must come and look at the, at the Russian built car uh, constructed by Yakovlev and Freza. And his response, at least as it's recorded to us, is no need to look at it. The foreign ones are better. So the Yakovlev and Freza, they receive no rewards for this. They're going to win some silver medals uh, for the other things that they produce out of their manufacturers, but the car attracts absolutely no attention. Yakovlev is going to die in 1898, about a year and a half later, thus ending the partnership. So Freza decides he wants to make another go at it, so he applies later in the year, in 1899, for permission to set up a new joint stock enterprise, another company. He opens her business in 1899, and in 1902, uh, the Freza company begins producing the first Russian-made motorized trolleys, trucks, and buses. And here are some early examples of them. Orders begin to trickle in a little bit from local businesses, but the firm is struggling to find purchasers. Who in Russia is going to buy these things? You know what Russian roads are like outside of the cities. We talked about that many, many weeks back. It hasn't really improved all that much. In 1903, 
Frez's company finally catches a break when it sells 14 automobiles to the St. Petersburg Post Office. So the St. Petersburg, the government, in other words, we've talked about this before, the state, the principal market for many of these, these technological innovations. The post, mark, uh, the, uh, the post office buys 14 of the vehicles, and the firm is going to sign a side contract that stipulates the firm will also provide drivers and mechanics that the post office will pay for. Because not everybody can drive a car in 1903, so they've got a supplemental revenue stream. And all things are going well when less than a year later, the garage in which these 14 motor cars are kept catches fire and they're all destroyed. As luck would have it. In 1907, the Freza Company uh, is, going to get a, is going to receive a gold medal showing at St. Petersburg's first Russian automobile exposition, demonstrating here the quality of his work, but the, the quality of his work really isn't a substitute for markets. And there's no market in 1907. Freza is running low on capital. Uh, he's deciding to, he decides to call it quits. He's going to sell off his company in, uh, in 1910 in order to raise money to provide uh, an adequate inheritance for his children. He will end up selling off his, uh, his interest to something known as the Russo Balt Carriage Factory. But here we see a real contrast right, between the successful Shulkov, who is allied with the Americanized body, who gives him the security, the material support, the outlet or the, uh, the, the network of, of, of commercial uh, purchasers that he needs to continue inventing and thriving, whereas Freza and the dearly departed Yakovlev struggle and never achieve the kind of success that they might have, even though they were the very first in Russia to do you know, construct internal combustion engines to construct a first automobile. This is, this is the way of, of, of Russian innovation. Oftentimes it comes down to just a matter of luck. And there are so few Russian inventors that have a great deal, so have sufficient luck or serendipity given the context in which they're operating. So the Nizhny Novgorod exposition or e exhibition is designed as a show uh, as a showpiece technology. It's, it's a great uh, example of, of, of compensatory symbolism that's designed to put the best forward of the of, of to put the best foot forward for the state and to demonstrate all the miraculous things that are underway in Russia during the moment now when Russia's industrial takeoff is really starting um, to, uh, to move forward. <coughs> in truth, like so many other things in Russian history, these, these great state construction projects dating into the, into the Soviet history as well, there's a, there's a backstory to all this. Behind the, the, the gleaming buildings, behind uh, the, the brightly colored uh, edifices, behind the facade, of the exposition, there was a, another lingering truth. And the lingering truth was that many of these technologies were not directly affecting or altering the lives of ordinary Russian citizens. You had a vast pool of laborers, peasants, downtrodden and outcast, who never experience, although they might see these technologies, they're never going to be able to experience them, purchase them, or, or uh, enjoy them uh, for themselves. And their, story, their stories during the exhibition are, are being told by a fellow uh, by the name of Maxim Gorky. He's born Alexei Peshkov. Um, in 1868, he's actually uh, an inhabitant, an original inhabitant. He's born in Nizhny Novgorod. Um, he had been orphaned at the age of 11 and spent his childhood wandering the river towns and seaports of southern Russia. For over a decade, he lived among prostitutes and pickpockets. He lived among the lower depths, as he would call them among criminals and, and, and impoverished workers, holy fools, and other social cast-offs. But there's one thing that would separate Gorky from those around him among the lower classes, and that was his passion for reading. He would learn to read at an early age, and he would begin writing. He had a thirst for this kind of knowledge, even though he had himself less than one year of formal education. He abandons his vagabond life in the early 1920s, and he begins working for a provincial newspaper. In 1896, after four or five years working as a, uh, what we would call today, um, a freelance writer, because you don't, there aren't permanent journalistic positions for Russian newspapers. Or, or you, what you would do is you would work on sort of piece rate. You submit a story to the editor, the editor likes to pay you. So you're doing what we would call freelance work. He's going to be hired out by a couple of newspapers to report on the exposition 
1896. And he ends up writing his stories that don't just talk about the beautiful facades, but talk as well about the workers who he encounters behind the scenes building the expositions. And what he does is in his journalistic writings is he contrasts the facade of power and technological acuity with the lingering backwardness of rural peasant Russia. Now, I don't have time this evening to talk about this in detail. I will, su I will, I will su suffice to say that the, the little newspaper stories, and he produces about four or five dozen of these while the exhibition is, is, is going on. What they did is they served to undermine official accounts of the exhibition. They uncovered aspects of the ostentatious spectacle that were hidden from public view, sort of stripped away that state-constructed facade to reveal the flawed and morally suspect assumptions on which this, the event and the Tsarist state's claims to greatness were founded. What Gorky's articles did is they called into question the presumed link between technological and moral progress. And they raised real doubts about the direction in which technological change was leading the nation. The stories he wrote were so piercing and so insightful. I, I told you Tsar Nicholas II comes to visit the exhibition. While Tsar Nicholas is in town, Gorky's stories are not allowed to appear in the newspapers. As soon as the Tsar leaves, his stories are so wanted by readers that they reappear. So they're going to temporarily censor Gorky. They're not going to let any of those stories be published while the Tsar is in Nizhny Novgorod. At heart, what Gorky is, what, the way that Gorky interprets the exhibition is he sees it sort of as a, as a fleeting fantasy. It's an artificial world that's built to impress, but it's an artificial world that offers little of substance to those in Russia who need it most, the country's toiling and subjugated masses. There weren't many of those people at the exhibition. The exhibition had been designed for dignitaries and state officials, members of well-to-do society, foreigners, journalists, what Russians would call then chistaya publica, the clean public, as opposed to chornaya, the dark masses, the laborers, the peasants, the bottom rungs of society. What happened in 1891, 1892? What major event transforms the relationship between society and the state? 1896 exhibition is coming less than five years removed, less than four years removed, from the famine of 1891-1892 that killed upwards of half a million people. Half a million people not four years ago died because all the state wanted to do was export grain in order to import, to raise the capital it needed to import the machinery. That ex exhibition is not simply built through the expenditure of 50 million rubles, it's built in no small part because of the expenditure of 500,000 lives by the state. That is what roils Gorky. Because everybody has that in the back of their minds. They understand what's going on among the chorni narod, the, the dark people, the dark masses, that they continue to suffer. And in fact, they do. Russia's lower classes are going to experience and understand these technological transformations in a much different way than members of well-to-do society experience and understand them. What is opened up by the closing decade of the 19th century is a huge gulf between educated Russian opinion, the emerging obsessiveness, the emerging public sphere, and the hundreds of thousands, the millions of peasants who still remain isolated thanks to the emancipation of 1861 and the manner in which the peasants were freed from bondage, creating effectively a second class of citizenship or a second class of subjects. Lower class subjects sought these technological devices differently. This was particularly true of factory workers, whose daily encounter with technology occurs on the factory workshop floor. Ordinary workers tend to see <coughs> technologies as threatening and harmful. They tend not to share the triumphal views espoused by privileged members of the aristocracy or the upper classes. Emerging millions are becoming uh, literate. They are not necessarily fluent in their native Russian, but I've talked about this, the expanse of, of 
primary education, of secondary education, of universities, and especially of the polytechnics. And what you have by the 1890s are the emergence of what we might refer to as a plebeian intelligentsia, sort of a, the, the thinking working men who would be inspired by what they saw in their daily lives to write and to create artistically. There are people like Alexei Bibik, uh, a second generation lathe off, uh, operator who's, who's something of a poet and who writes poems describing factories as soulless dins, where, where uh, engines and gears and transmission belts, quote, thunder like a huge cauldron filled with thousands of sounds pouring together in an unbroken anguished and hopeless howl. The factory isn't a place for creativity and for the uplift of the nation and for the recreation of a new Russia. It is instead like a living and breathing hell because the, 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 the conditions that factory workers endured in Russia in the 1880s, the 1890s, the opening decades of the 20th century in the midst of Russia's industrial takeoff were oftentimes quite quite terrible. Industrial enterprises were dangerous places. They were filled with noxious fumes. They were jam-packed with rapidly moving machinery. They posed dangers to life and limb. If you lose an arm or a leg because it gets caught up in the machinery in the factory, what's your compensation? Maybe a couple of rubles and then you're going to be fired because you're no use to the factory owner. Russian industrialists in the 1880s and 1890s exercised almost complete control over their authorities control that was not dissimilar from the rural estate owner and the former serf. The worst treatment included humiliating punishments. You could be flogged for being late to work. You could be flogged for falling down on the job. There were all sorts of other common indignities. And the one that I keep going back to is, is, is the way in which they were referred to. Russia has a, a, a formal and an informal you. Russian workers were always addressed informally by their factory owners and by their bosses, just like, the, just like you would address a dog or a kid, a child. You'd use informal with them because they're beneath you. They're common in dignity. The hardest hit among <coughs> Russian workers were those at the very, excuse me, at the very bottom of the labor hierarchy. <coughs> because you have in Russia in the 1890s oversupply of labor. And what this means is that unskilled laborers are basically disposable. There are more than enough of them out there. You just, someone gets injured, you kick them out, you bring another one in. Government agents could do little to alter the dismal circumstances. There were hard-won laws prohibiting things like the nighttime employment of women and children. There are also limits to the workday, reduced to 11 and a half hours by 1897. But this doesn't help much because the government doesn't have the money, it doesn't have the wherewithal to enforce the regulations. So what good are the regulations if they aren't enforced? Despite the deplorable circumstances, and I'll give you guys a chance to stretch your legs here in just a second. Despite the deplorable working conditions in Russian factories, very, very few people were deterred from going to work there. Why? Well, because the alternatives in the countryside were worse. Industrial jobs are going to draw millions of young peasants out of the countryside and into the cities in the closing years of the, 20, of the 19th century. Life in the villages was monotonous. It was isolated. It wasn't, you know, cholera breaks out there as well. Between 1897 and 1917, the number of urban subjects more than doubled in Russia from 12.5 million to just under 26 million. Now, only St. Petersburg and Moscow have more than a million inhabitants on the eve of World War I. But Odessa, Kiev, and Warsaw each exceed 500,000. Now, you have all of a sudden a, a large number of growing large cities. In absolute, now, overall, overall, urban residents only comprise 18% of the empire's population of 175 million. This is, a, this is about uh, World War I, 1913. 18% are urban dwellers out of a population of 175 million. But in absolute terms, count heads, there are 23 million or so urban residents in European Russia. That is far more than the 17 million in France or the 9 million in Italy. So as a percentage of the overall population, industrial laborers are relatively small. But in absolute terms, in 
absolute terms, there are more people living in cities in Russia than there are in France or in Italy. Russian cities, Russian cities proved to be no more competent at dealing with this rapid influx of people from the village into the factory than the English had been in the 1820s and the 1830s, or the French had been in the 1830s and 1840s during Europe's Industrial Revolution. Municipal governments are going to struggle with the infrastructure necessary to provide the modern amenities of urban life. There simply isn't enough money to be had because the state is capital poor. Urban spending on health, education, and public works will increase substantially between the 1880s and 19 teens, but capital investment goes mostly to modernizing well-to-do commercial centers, where the money is. Virtually nothing is spent on the outlying regions in which the urban working class live, reside, and make, uh, make the money they need to survive. Okay. So what we see now in the 1880s and the turn of the 20th century is the relatively rapid, I mean, the Russian development takes place last among the European states, but that period of development is going to be the most concentrated. It's going to, it's going to emerge the most rapidly. The, the British Industrial Revolution unfolds between 1760, roughly 1830, 1840. That's 70 to 80 years. Russia's development is going to, is going to be telescoped into a period of about 15 to 20 years. And all those tensions, all those pressures are going to build up even faster. And because of the way in which Russia industrializes, these enterprises and these factories very quickly assuming gigantic proportions, you end up with a very highly concentrated labor force located in the two most important cities, Moscow and St. Petersburg, the capital city, the head of the government, and also the leading industrial manufacturing center and armaments manufacturing center in the country. Where is the labor unrest going to unfold when people get pissy? In Moscow and St. Petersburg. In the United States, where does it take place in the 1870s and 1880s? In places like Chicago, New York. New York. Your Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 19, was it 1905, 1907? Uh, the, the Haymarket Riot, 1877. Yeah. Okay. It's not occurring in Washington, D.C because America's capital city doesn't produce much other than hot air. Right? There's, there's not a, it's not an industrial center the way that Chicago, New York is, or that Moscow and St. Petersburg are for the, for the Russian Empire. What does all this mean? I'll tell you after you stretch your legs. Take five. You guys are fading on me. We'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about this.